The terror group ISIS and their ideology was the focus of a hearing held by the Senate Homeland Security Committee. We heard from a Yazidi woman who was captured and enslaved by ISIS and then escaped. Members also discussed how the group's ideology relates to and motivates so-called lone wolf actors, like the mass shooter in Orlando, Florida. From Capitol Hill, this is about two hours. Good morning. This hearing will come to order. Uh, we do have one witness uh, who parked over Union Station. He's making his way over here, so I thought we'd get going and, and he can join us uh, when he gets here. Uh, I, I want to thank the witnesses for appearing, for your time, for your testimony. Uh, the mission statement of this committee, uh, you've heard it repeatedly, but I'll, I'll repeat it again, is to enhance the economic and national security of America. Uh, on the Homeland Security side, our, our, one, of, one of our top four priorities is, is certainly doing whatever we can to, to keep our homeland safe, to counter Islamic terror. The goal of every hearing, from my standpoint, uh, coming from a manufacturing background, has solved a lot of problems. The first step in solving a problem is admitting you have one, properly defining it, identifying it, defining it, but really facing reality. And so the goal of every hearing is to lay out a reality so that certainly the members of the committee, the people in the audience, understand what we're dealing with with a particular problem. Uh, today's hearing is, is our eighth hearing, uh, dealing with some form of component of the, 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 the threat we face from Islamic terror. Uh, it's a harsh reality. It's one I wish was not true. It was one I wish we didn't have to face, but we have to. Uh, we're going to be hearing testimony today that will be hard to hear. It'll be hard to hear. But it's testimony that I think is incredibly important for us to hear. So again, I thank the witnesses for, for appearing. I, I would ask that my written statement be entered in the record without objection. It's important for us to understand that Islamic terrorists declared war on the United States. Quite honestly, Islamic terrorists declared war on the civilized world. We didn't declare war on them, they declared war on us. I can't exactly point to the date, but certainly one that's pretty visible was the first attempt to bring down the Twin Trade Towers. That was on February 26, 1993. And the fact that we didn't face the full reality right there and then, I think eventually led to the fact that we, we then faced the tragedy of 9-11, of where almost 3,000 Americans were slaughtered in that terrorist attack. Now, there are two ways to end a war, only two ways. Either one side defeats the other, 
or both sides decide to lay down their arms. The, the tragic events of yet another ISIS-inspired terror attack on this country in Orlando has proven Islamic terrorists are not laying down their arms. So the only way we're going to end this war, the only way we're going to keep our homeland safe, return peace to the civilized world, is if we defeat Islamic terrorists, if we defeat ISIS. Now, on September 10, 2014, President Obama laid out America's goal as it relates to ISIS. It was pretty simply stated, to degrade and ultimately defeat them. That was 22 months ago. 22 months ago. In testimony last week before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, CIA Director John Brennan laid out the reality as, re as it relates to our success or lack thereof in our war on, on ISIS. And he testified, and this is a quote, that ISIS remains a formidable, resilient, and largely cohesive energy, enemy. And that our efforts have not reduced their terrorism capability and their global reach. Now that is a depressing reality after 22 months. But it's a reality we have to face. So uh, again, I, I just want to thank the witnesses. Um, don't hold back. Lay out the reality. Make sure that certainly the senators on this dais, that the American people understand the threat, the enemy we face, and why it is just crucial that we actually defeat them. I, I, I wish they'd lay down their arms. I wish they'd declare peace. But it doesn't seem like that's going to happen. With that, I'll turn it over to my ranking member, Senator Carper. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, uh, I, first of all, thank you for delaying this hearing for a, a week uh, so that uh, our witnesses could be assembled and we have more time to prepare for this, uh, for, this, uh, for this hearing. We welcome each of you. Thank you for coming and sharing with us uh, your stories and your perspectives. They are valued and we're delighted that, uh, that you could come. Uh, I want to just follow up uh, very briefly on the, uh, how the, uh, the fight against ISIS is, is going. I went over a, a map today of uh, that uh, part of the world. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the U.S. and our coalition forces, which now number about 60 nations, have recaptured almost 50 percent of the land that ISIS held uh, once in, in Iraq and, and in Syria. Almost 50 percent. I think we're up to about 40 per 47 percent. ISIS has also lost 20 percent of the land it once held in Syria. Uh, Ramadi and Tikrit uh, were key victories for U.S. backed Iraqi forces. And last Friday, Iraqi forces, Iraqi forces, ground forces, uh, captured the city uh, center of Fallujah and are now working to clear out the last few pockets of resistance in that city. Uh, and so it's only uh, about 20, 25 miles uh, west of, of, of Baghdad. As we speak, uh, Kurdish, Iraqi, and Syrian uh, democratic forces backed by the U.S. Special Forces are making preparations to retake ISIS key strongholds in Mosul and Raqqa. We've killed some 25,000 ISIS fighters and more than 120 key ISIS leaders. We've cut ISIS funds by uh, a third or more. We've literally destroyed hundreds of millions of dollars in cash that they were hoarding, and we've reduced by a dramatic amount their ability to, to uh, re uh, realize profits from oil uh, uh, reserves and, and, and resources in that part of the world. We've drastically uh, slowed the flow of foreign recruits from a high of about 2,000 a month in 2014 to 200 a month today. And that also goes for, uh, for young Americans who have sought to travel to join ISIS abroad one year ago, one year ago, about uh, every month about 10 Americans were leaving uh, this country to join ISIS. Today that number is one per month. And at home the FBI is cracking down on recruits as well. And over the past two years the FBI has, uh, has arrested 88 individuals on ISIS related charges. I was a naval flight officer for 23 years combined active and reserve duty. I've served five years in a hot war in Southeast Asia. I know a little bit about fighting wars. Uh, and another 18 years right up to the end of the Cold War as a P-3 aircraft mission commander. And uh, one of the ways we're going to win this fight is uh, not by ourselves. There's not an appetite in this country for putting boots on the ground. But there is an appetite for working through with a coalition of uh, countries throughout the region and around the world. And that is what we're doing. And uh, I believe we're making progress. Uh, is it uh, perfect? Are we where we want to be? Is this where we want to go? No, it is not. But I think we're making progress. The other thing I want to say, last uh, mm, Saturday, 
nine days ago, ten days ago, my wife and I went up to um, uh, New York. We have a son who lives in that, uh, that area in the city. And uh, we, uh, he took us for Father's Day uh, and his mom's birthday, took us to a 9-11 museum, which is built, located right on the location of the twin, where the Twin Towers once uh, stood. I was reminded there, as we saw the faces and the names and heard the voices of the family members of th some 3,000 people who died that day, I was reminded of the way we responded to that tragedy. In this room, in this room, we helped to create the 9-11 Commission. In this room, we received some 40 recommendations, bipartisan group, 9-11 Commission, presented to us uh, by Tom Kane, former governor of New Jersey, presented to us by Lee Hamilton, former uh, House, uh, uh, House uh, Chairman of Foreign Relations Committee, co-chairs of the 9-11 uh, Commission. They, they presented to us, after months and months of work, some 40 recommendations that they came to unanimously on what we could do to reduce the likelihood that these kinds of attacks would occur uh, again. We adopted maybe 80% of them, again, almost unanimously, and then set about uh, uh, implementing them. The uh, response to that tragedy was bipartisan. It was a unified approach, and I think ultimately it's been successful. Ultimately, it's been successful. And when you compare that uh, response to the response to the tragedy in, in Orlando, it could not be more different. could not be more different. My hope today is that we're going to have the kind of conversation with all of you that will enable us to better uh, improve uh, this fight. And this is a fight that we're going to win, a fight against ISIS. And we have a lot of allies, and they happen to be not, uh, not just folks in this country, not just people who might be Catholic or Protestant, people of all faiths, including the Muslim faith. And together, uh, we're going to prevail. Thank you so much. And Mr. Chairman, I have to ask that the unanimous consent, if I could, that the rest of my statement uh, be entered in the record. Thank you. Without objection. Uh, it is the tradition of this committee to swear in witnesses, so if you all rise and raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Please be seated. Our first witness is Mr. Hassan Hassan. Mr. Hassan is an associate fellow at the Tahir Institute for Middle East Policy. Mr. Hassan co-authored ISIS, Inside the Army of Terror. In 2008, he started working in Abu Dhabi in journalism and research focusing on Syria, Iraq, and Gulf states, and studying Islamists, Salafists, and jihadist movements in the wider region. Mr. Hassan. Thank you, Chairman Johnson and Ranking Member uh, Carper and uh, members of the committee. Uh, by way of uh, introduction, I also want to add that uh, I come from an ISIS-controlled area uh, that is still controlled today. I also um, have also interviewed dozens of ISIS member, uh, members for my, uh, for my book and, uh, and, and other research. Uh, and I want to say this. Um, uh, this is not a sectarian war. Uh, the very people that ISIS claims to represent are victims of its brutality just as much as uh, uh, everyone else. There is, uh, there's, this, is, this is reality felt on a daily basis. When uh, family and friends go to the market and see uh, severed heads uh, on pipes, uh, or uh, when ISIS condemns uh, its Sunni uh, opponents, people that they claim to represent as apostates, they burn them alive, they stab their uh, hearts before they shoot them, they display their, ha uh, their uh, dead bodies uh, for days in central squares. Um, when it says uh, to its fellow Sunnis, it doesn't matter if, you're, uh, if you pray, if you fast in Ramadan, uh, if you, uh, you know, turn your face towards Mecca and pray, uh, we will still kill you uh, as long as you don't pledge allegiance to us. Uh, not, from, uh, not far from uh, where I come from in, uh, uh, in, in my area called uh, Deir Zor, uh, ISIS killed 700 Sunni villagers in a matter of days uh, because they dared to stand up uh, against the group. Uh, and uh, I want to move on to say that as a belief system, those who believe in the Islamic, uh, in the sort of Islamic state uh, ideology are a minority, not only in the Muslim world, but also within the group. Uh, uh, during my research, I found that members come in six categories. One, uh, long-standing religious radicals who deviate even from Al-Qaeda. Uh, for example, uh, they believe that there's no sanctity uh, of life. Uh, unlike Al-Qaeda, which... Uh, for example, uh, justifies killing civilians, but only as collateral damage. ISIS uh, considers killing civilians itself 
uh, is uh, the preferred outcome. Uh, in, in fact, just like, uh, a month ago, exactly a month ago, uh, the spokesperson of ISIS said uh, uh, when he called for uh, sympathizers in the West, in Europe, and uh, in, in the United States to launch attacks, he said, uh, I received complaints from people, sympathizers, saying uh, we couldn't find uh, military targets uh, and, and we uh, are afraid to kill civilians. And he said there is no such thing as uh, innocent civilians in the West. And in fact, he moved on to say, uh, we prefer that you kill civilians. Uh, and he said, I don't have time to justify that. Uh, basically, he didn't even uh, have the justification uh, 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 during the statement. And uh, the second category of people who join uh, ISIS are uh, young zealots who are victims of the first uh, category. People who are, uh, uh, you know, between uh, 12 to uh, 17, people who are drawn to this idea of a caliphate and, and so on and so forth. Uh, they're uh, brainwashed. Uh, uh, they, they are uh, taught to uh, taught, uh, Islam in, in, a, in a way that ISIS understands. It distorts uh, a lot of things, and because people don't have uh, religious knowledge, they hear a lot of the events and uh, uh, the, the traditions that ISIS relates for the first time. Uh, and there's a third category, which is very important, uh, people who are drawn to ISIS political ideology, not religious one, and this is a major, uh, a major problem not only within ISIS, but I think in the region, people who, uh, who were drawn to this uh, political ideology, not only for ISIS, uh, ISIS but Al-Qaeda and other Islamist groups, uh, because they, 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 they think there is political stagnation in the region and only these groups can actually shake up the political order in the region. And I think uh, Omar uh, Mateen uh, uh, belongs to this uh, category of people who are only superficially uh, uh, influenced by this organization. Uh, he obviously didn't uh, follow their uh, way of life, but uh, he still uh, uh, was, he was still animated probably by, by, the, by this uh, idea of the Islamic State. The other categories are those who are drawn to the group because of its uh, military success, model of governance, attraction to brutality, and, or, or uh, simply uh, their profiteers. Uh, but the group, uh, and this is important, but the group uh, swims in a sea of political failures in the region, and that's where we should uh, focus. Uh, it's not a surprise, for example, that ISIS emerged in, Ir in Iraq and in Syria countries that suffered unimaginable brutality, violence over the past decade uh, in the case of Iraq and half decade in the case of Syria. The group uh, has built its narrative around the idea of uh, Sunni victimization. It benefited from the brutal reality in both Iraq and Syria to say that Sunnis are systematically under attack by Iranian-backed militias or governments in, other, uh, and, and, uh, or, uh, or governments in, the, in those two countries and that the two greatest superpowers in the world uh, are helping uh, both of them, and that there are, there are traitors, apostates, in other words, in our midst who help them. It's important, without downplaying, downplaying the genocidal acts of ISIS, to highlight that the regime of Bashar Assad in Damascus had carried out almost all the atrocities, probably without an exception, that ISIS has committed uh, even before ISIS arrived in Syria. In 2012, for example, pro-government militias in Syria stormed villages, slaughtered children and women, and smashed using rocks, uh, heads of condemned people. Uh, and I, I just want to conclude by saying uh, and emphasizing that ISIS thrives in this context and should be defeated in this context to stem its international appeal. This can only happen at the hands of the very people that ISIS claims to represent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hassan. Our next witness is Dr. Tariq El Gawari. Uh, Dr. El Gawari is the Director of Religious Studies Programs for the World Organization for Resource Development and Education. Dr. El Gawari also serves as the CEO of the Coexist Corporation and a trustee of the Coexist Foundation. He has a PhD from Princeton in Islamic Law and he studied traditional Islamic sciences at El Azhar Seminary in Cairo, Egypt. Dr. El, El Gawari. Senators Johnson, Senators Carper, thank you very much for this opportunity, other members of the committee. Uh, I'd like to make very brief introductory remarks and save the other maybe uh, discussion points for questions and answers. Uh, I'd like to add to what Senator Johnson said in the beginning that before ISIS uh, or ISIL and other related groups declared war on our, on our homeland, they declared war on Islam. Um, and this is not only a threat to our homeland, not only a threat to our national security, but an existential threat to our religion. Normative Islam in both its Sunni and Shia expressions 
is defined by a very robust interpretive methodology. That's what you go to seminary to be trained in. Very briefly, this interpretive methodology requires one to understand the divine texts, to understand the texts of the Quran, to understand the various statements of the Prophet. There are 6,236 verses in the Quran. There are about 60 to 70,000 prophetic texts. In their different narrations, there's over 100,000 narrations of these prophetic texts. Understanding the divine text means understanding about a dozen different sciences, beginning with Arabic grammar, syntax, morphology, logic, all of these different interpretive tools that we use to understand what does the text actually mean in the context in which it was revealed. The second thing is to understand the context that we live in now, the current moment, understanding full well that people change, times change, circumstance change, and location and place change. How does one fast the month of Ramadan in the northern latitudes in which the early Muslim generations never experienced? How do we deal with usury in, in, the, in the light of fiat currency, currency that's not backed by gold or silver bullion, so on and so forth? So then that further adds that one needs to understand the current moment that we live in and its complexity and its changing. And then the third aspect of this interpretive paradigm is how do we link the divine text into the current moment in which we live. And that, as we were taught, is a talent. Not everyone is endowed with that type of talent. Violent and extremist groups like ISIL have no interpretation whatsoever, nor do they have a fundament fundamental understanding of Islam. They are unlettered warmongers who have, in essence, created a parallel religion. Yet this parallel religion that they call to is no more Islamic than a pool with one lemon squeezed in it is lemonade. And because of their gross misunderstanding of the primary text, because of their lack of a robust interpretive methodology, the good news is we are able to identify what is so wrong with their thinking. And in my work and in my analysis, I have been able to deduce about a half a dozen or so main concepts that they have and been able to trace them back to a certain cluster of sources that are used by every single Islamist extremist group from the middle of the 20th century until our time today. And in that, I'm able to isolate those concepts. We're able to provide a counter narrative and deal with it. Now, I, I don't have a, an army at my disposal. I don't own any weapons whatsoever. I leave that to the law enforcement. But what I do have is I have my intellect, I have my scholarly training, and I can employ that to provide a robust counter narrative to inoculate our youth to protect the next generation, and to make it absolutely unequivocally clear that what ISIL represents, what they stand for, has nothing to do with the religion whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. El Gawari. Our next witness is Mr. Subhai Nahas. Uh, Mr. Nahas is an activist for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights who fled Syria in 2012 after receiving threats from soldiers and jihadists because of his sexual preference. Nah Mr. Nahas fled first to Lebanon and then to Turkey, where he applied with the United Nations for refugee status. He was granted refugee status after a year and has since moved to the United States. In August 2015, he testified before the United Nations Security Council Summit on LGBT rights in Syria. Mr. Nahas. Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Carper, members of the committee, thank you for offering me the honor and the opportunity to be here today to share my my story in the context of the larger events happening here in the, in the world and here in the United States. My personal story mirrors the stories of many, many other LGBT individuals. One day I was heading to university. An organized group of militants ac accosted and threatened me solely because they perceived me as gay. In a local mosque, it had been announced that they would cleanse the city of all sodomites. ISIS had not yet been formed, yet militants and the regime targeted all gay men in the country. I fled, I fled from my home country of Syria in 2012. After living in a country of Lebanon for six months, I moved to Turkey. My history of activism for LGBT rights meant that, that even in Turkey, I once again find myself in danger. Extremist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS were gaining strength and access there. Although I was employed for two years in a senior position with Save the Children International, 
I was still not safe because of my sexual identity. A Syrian friend informed me that I had been targeted for death. My director at Save the Children helped me register with the UN Refugee uh, Agency to be resettled to a safer country. Prior to my resettlement, I completed an extremely thorough screening process which included testifying under oath in front of an officer from the DHS, security checks, medical tests, and cultural orientation. After this 10 months process, I was relocated to San Francisco. In August 2015, a few months after resettlement, I spoke before members of the UN Security Council about the threats to sexual minorities in the Middle East during a historic event organized by the United States and Chile. As I stated during the meeting and to the press, along with Ambassador Samantha Power, ISIS was simply one of many threats to the LGBT community in the Middle East. Reports from recent refugees of Syria say that ISIS and other groups actively target gay people. It is enough just to be perceived as gay by them, to be arrested, tortured, or raped. Then this perceived gay person can be thrown off of a building to a cheerful crowd that will stone them to death if they are not dead. While ISIS is viewed by the public eye as the most notorious group in Syria and Iraq, it may come as a surprise that their methodology when it comes to the treatment of LGBT people is very similar to many other groups, including governments themselves. We know that many groups, including ISIS, target and kill gay people in Syria. They just use different methods to kill. While good fortune has allowed me to, be, to begin a new, much safer life as a refugee in the United States, recent events in Orlando show that LGBT people still face huge challenges here. The New York Times reported on June 16th, even before the shooting rampage at the gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida, Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people were already the most likely, likely targets of hate crimes in America, according to analysis of data collected by the FBI. Put simply, efforts to discredit the poisonous ideology of ISIS and other extremist groups, while extremely important, are insufficient to completely erase the threats of anti-LGBT violence, either here in this country or abroad. Rather, we must, uh, we, mu we must also commit to combating homophobia, xenophobia, and bigotry in all of its various forms, regardless of the source. In order to deal with these issues, I recommend two things. One, through the bridges and convening power unique to the United Nations, support actions that promote not only human rights for LGBT persons, but also love, inclusion, tolerance, and equality among religious, religions and communities. This required continued U.S. leadership at forums like the UN Human Rights Council and supporting funding for the UN institutions like the UN Refugee Agency. Statements such, such as the one issued by the Security Council on Monday condemning the Orlando attack are critical. This statement specifically denounced the fir for the first time violence targeting people as a result of their sexual orientation, and it received support from Russia and Egypt. This will make it more difficult for those countries and others to argue that sexual orientation is not, recognized, is not a recognized international human right. Two, we need partnerships across communities that can address the serious negative consequences of ISIS ideology including assisting the, com assisting the communities affected by it. For example, I have launched a SPECTRA project which assists LGBT refugees in the Middle East and North Africa region by providing shelter and education, while also promoting in the U.S. and abroad the, a more positive image of the LGBT people. So thank you again for this opportunity, sir. Thank you, Mr. Nahas. Our final witness is Ms. Nadia Murad. Uh, Ms. Murad is a Yazidi rights activist and one of the thousands of Yazidi women who were abducted and enslaved by ISIS. Since her escape, Nadi has been outspoken about her experiences to draw attention to the ongoing genocide. Earlier this year, the Iraqi government nominated her for the 2016 Nobel Peace Prize. Ms. Murad. I will mention that uh, Murad, uh, coincidentally, is her interpreter.
Thank you. Sayyid Chairman, Ahadat Majlis Shur, Skeleke Shamam Nunum Go, or the Awam El Vida Rekidia, Skeleke Kif Hosham Goidos, Veke Bushar. Mr. Chairman, uh, dear Senators, I'm very grateful and very happy to be testifying among you and thank you for the opportunity. Very hard to take Midwest Bishmawa Good. جریما هکل اورلاندو چه بوی دلی مگله که ایشان شبروان ضحیه شبر نفساوی ارهابی بو شبر نفسامه خلک عادی بون بونا ضحیهوی تشت The first thing I would like to tell you is that I was heartbroken when I witnessed the crimes in Orlando because for the same reason, for no reason they were killed as and they were abused just the way I was او تشته بوی اس بی نفاجئیم اشبر مزانی شروجا می داعش د دی دی مزانی کو اف ارهاب حکت نہ ہات سکنانن وی کار بے جریمت خوب گہنی ہر جہ کی بٹ ائی واز سرپرائز سرپرائز بے دس بیکاز ائی نیو اف ائیسس واز ناٹ سٹاپڈ دے ول ڈیلیور देयर کرائمز ایوری ویر کس ہات ما گرتن حمرے میں نوز د سال بون شش ہزار کے چوج نوزارو کے عزت یار سات مسبی کرن When I was captured, I was 19 years old. I was one of the 6,000 Yazidi women and children who were taken into captivity. This happened on August 2014, more than a year and a half now, and ISIS attacked the Yazidis for one reason, because they are considered infidels, not people of the book, and their interpretation is that the men must be killed and the women and the children must be enslaved. And this is what they applied to us. Thousands of men, women, and children were killed in the first day of the attack in Sinjar. وصار يسد هزار إنساني إزدي الروجد هريد قرم تريدا الجادة محاصر كرن. In the hottest days of the summer, more than a hundred thousand Yazidis were stranded on the mountain. أفتش تب ما هاتا كرن راست جريمة العراق والسوريا ده شيء بونو قلك خلك بضحية في تشتي بس يا إزدي تشتكي مختلف بو. It's true that crimes were committed in Iraq and Syria, but what happened to the Yazidis was different. برنامة هزارت کچکار الموسیلی، امبونا سبیا نفدست داعشده. I was one of the girls who were enslaved in Mosul. I was one of the among the thousands of the women who were taken to Mosul. چته هری بری مکرین، ام هاد نواز عاندن ول بی واز عاندن ایرا المحکم موسیل ده دست مال سر قرآنی کرین گو ام دینی خواب غیری نه. The first thing they did in Mosul was to after distributing us to the fighters, was to taking us to the court and have us convert by putting our hand on the Quran. اختصاب حقيقة كان هسالية حلال بو السروي الشريعة دولة الإسلامية. It is true that I was raped and sold and was abused but i was lucky i wish that every one from the 6000 women and children was like me because girls at age of 9 were raped as well el gunde mida el khilala de saada da kushtna hafsid insani ezdi un nef wan de shash biraw da ka miji hatina kushtna el roja ke da bas chma ezdi bun jdina ki mukhtalif only in 2 hours in my village more than 700 men were killed among them were 6 of my brother and the same day my mother was killed too for no reason but for having a different religion asnabi jim islam hamu irhaba bas daesh uh, I'm not saying that ISIS represents the Islam, but ISIS is using the Islam to commit these crimes. And this needs to stop as an ideology first. جبر الجلك عجنا هات يكرن جو ببنا داعش وكو خلك الشنقالي دا وقت الرابو يهاتين بداعش الرابو ينكارن أو جحالي خبقنا إزد يا درك من بس بكيف بون جو بداعش الرابو نو بيتشتي بتابع. Many people in the area that had they had the choice to leave when ISIS came, but they 
were happy to join the Islamic State when they came. قالك تشت هاي سيرو بيجم بس مع الأسف وقت نينا جوز هم وبيجم وأس نكارم هم وبإنجليزي شو ربي جم جوز كارم الوقت خدا خلاصكم. There is many things for me to testify about to tell you today. Just the time is limited and I don't speak English. I wish I could tell you more. إش برويك مدة دقيقة كزيدة بس سبيب. I would like you to give you me one more minute if possible. Honestly, take your time. We want to hear the story. كلام كبير صح بيج. Take whatever time it takes. شن وقت يشتري بيج بيج. أفتشت. هاتا كرنو هاتا طبقة عندن السر إيزديا وهاتان وهفتشتي مستمرة. This was committed against the Yazidis first, and it's still continuous until now. أف رسالة مجها عند مصر وكويت إجبر في تشتب نافي إسلام تيتي أكرن. I delivered this message to Egypt and to Kuwait because this what is happening is been happening under the name of Islam. أب مرة أو خلكي تعاطف بو أو خلك مرة رابو. Go aftish manamat line. People there, they had a sympathy, and they said, "This does not represent us." But hat anu hai kish mahamu kani dia gosh ki ali dini va al dawlat al Arabi daesh hat ya kafirandin. But we have not seen that daesh have been labeled as infidel group within Islam from any Muslim country. وكتلبام الشيخ الأسهل كذي المصر دم جو داعش بكافرينا بس داعشنا هذا كافران. And I ask the leader of Azhar in Cairo is to say that ISIS is an infidel group within Islam and he has not committed to it yet. وقالك خلق العراق كتش كذي زدي بعض ذات كذي نمالي دواندا بس خدا نتكرن وكارين مساعدة بكنجي أب دزي وكدرين المساعدة وبكن بس وعندي نفس داعش تنيري جو كافرن. Many families in Iraq and Syria, when the Yazidi women and girls were escaping to these houses, they could have helped them, but no, they seized them and they they give them back to the militants. داعش سلاح خد سلاح خداين إلا جو أم بكن داعش سلاح خداين. داعش will not give up on their weapons unless we force them to give away their weapons. بري هر تشتكي جوان آليت دولة العربية بقومان عوان شبابا بقنا سرفي فكري بقهنا داعش. Before all, the Arab countries must stop the flow of the their citizens into Daesh and prevent them from joining Daesh. وأما نعيبك نقول سلاح ودراف نجاح يوان. And we have to prevent the supplies of weapon and money to them. وأما نعيبك نقول نفط وان نافروتن. And we prevent that their oil will not be sold. ودورال بيرا أم محاربة وان عسكريا بكن. And then we have to fight them militarily after that. إذا دي وغير إذا ديات أقليات الدينية كتجنا العراق ونالسوريا ده نكارن حماية خبكن. The Yazidis, all other religious minorities in Iraq, they are unable to protect themselves in Iraq and Syria. كدولة كقاسية في نكار به وقال أورلاندو تشيبو حماية بكا أو بلجيكا أو فرنسا. If a country as strong as your country cannot protect its citizens in Orlando or in Belgium or in France, how come a small minority like us can protect ourselves while we are in the heart of the land where the radical radicals are? Iros nizanim talbat shushwa bekam. Ajbar galak tishtaha gus talbe bekam. Ajbar hatan huwa ba dissala. There are many things for me to ask you because for two years we've been waiting, but the list is just too long for me to ask you. Azanim nuha hale se hazar u se sit ke chuj nu zaro ki ezdiya chel wedere. I know what is going on now with more than 3,200 Yazidi women, girls, and children who are still in captivity. Saat al sar mara der basid bu, wakt al saat ek der basid bu. أما تحسيان قد تشتكي قلقي مازن إيروش مرة هاتيش بر الوسعة ده قوامنا هاتنا فروتن يامنا هاتنا إيجار كرن. When I was held for every hour that passed, I was very happy and grateful for that hour if I was not sold, if I was not raped. One hour was counted for me and every hour was counting for me. أسيرو راستا خلاص كريمة بس أسنا شعر مبحور يا خلاص كرني إجبر هاتان هم حاسبا وان مجرمان هات يا كرن. I was freed, but I do not enjoy the feeling of the freedom because those who committed these crimes have not been held accountable. What happened to the Yazidi people was a genocide. Just the first day, thousands were killed. The forced displacement of 80% of the Yazidi people who do not 
اجبر جريمة جوه سري هزار كركي ازدي والمعسكرية سوريا دت بنا داعش بسالو نبكل سر نفساوي فكري and for holding more than a thousand Yazidi children in Syria to be trained to have the exact same ideology that the crimes were committed under اجبر او كتشكت نهسالي دهك هيجل الحياة هالطفولية دا because of the children who were at age of nine who didn't enjoy the childhood and became slaves. And for the people who drowned in the Asian Sea, and that's also a crime of ISIS because those people escaped because of ISIS. Because thousands of our children also have been prevented from going to school, and this is all because of them. Today I'm saying that small religious minorities such as the Yazidis, Christians, and other minorities, if they are not protected, they will be wiped out. We only are seeking peace. We want to live with dignity wherever we are. As a little girl, I had a dream, and that dream was to be to to open a beauty salon, and I was prevented from accomplishing that dream. And that's the exact same story with thousands of children and people like me who were prevented to continue pursuing their dreams. Chenabe on Sirib the day. إسلامتي هم بيستخدام كرين ولكن أف جريمات بين بنابي إسلامتي ولازم بسلمان أول الناس بين ضد ديفي تشتي بسكين. The racism should not be practiced against Islam, but these crimes have been committed under the name of Islam, and the Muslim must be the first one to 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 resist this. ومنابي يك مهاجمة دينك كامل بقى وقوة عائلة أسخلاص كريم الموسل ده. And I don't like anyone to be attacking an entire religion. For example, the family that. That liberated me in Mosul. But at the same time, this is being committed under the name of Islam. And there is so much time that is needed for me to tell my entire story, and I, but now I will stop and I will give you the opportunity to ask you any questions. Thank you, Ms. Murad. Um, thank you for your courage for coming forward and, and testifying. Let me just ask, uh, any of your family survive? Uh, yes, uh, two of my sisters, three of my brothers, and some of my nephews and nieces. Eighteen people from my family and extended families are still, they are killed, whether they are missing. Can you just tell us how you escaped? I never believed I would be able to escape because uh, not me or other girls because we were held in areas it was just vastly occupied by ISIS. The first couple of days I tried to escape uh, because I could not hold on more on the rape that was committed against me and the insult that was committed against me, I could not take it more. I decided to escape. I attempted to escape, but I was not successful. I was taken back, and I became a subject of rape by my multiple people, collective rape. 
مسلاوش موسل درکتم وان مسعدام کرب هویا ک اسلامی و صحر باند ما حدود. The second time I attempted to escape, it was successful, and a family in Mosul helped me, and they they made for me an Islamic ID, and with that ID, I was able to escape from Mosul. Uh, you, you mentioned there are 3,200 additional Yazidi girls and women being held captive. Are they dispersed throughout Syria and Iraq at this point in time? Oh. الهر جهة كي داعش تي موجود تي هيا وهكا إيرول جهة كينا بيسبوي إيا ويجي هجبر تينا فروتن وتينا كرن هرول جهة كينا أو الوان عراق وسوريا الهمو آل داعش Yes, they are everywhere because uh, they are not held in a specific, specific place What is happening is that they are being sold and their places will be changed from a place to another By the way, we are holding questioning five minutes because we have so many members attending this. Uh, again, thank you, Ms. Moret. I, I do want to go to Dr. El-Gawarhi, uh, a real scholar in Islam. Can, can you just explain, is there any way for you to, for us to understand, how, how, did, how did adherence of this barbarity, of this violence, how did it get to that point? What, what, what happened? So, uh, thank you, Nadia. And she, Nadia, mentioned. So Nadia was saying that uh, the Daesh, they, they don't represent Islam, but they use Islam. And she gave some examples, but they're using Islam even wrong. So, for example, they told her that she has to go to the court and she has to swear on the Quran to become a Muslim. But that's not how you become a Muslim. You become a Muslim by testifying, saying the testification of faith. So even, even small, mundane things, they don't even understand. And um, uh, I just was so moved by, by what she said. And it reminded me that, that, that there's a prophetic text, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, uh, fear the supplication of the oppressed because there is no veil between that supplication and the Lord. And he never mentioned that it's a Muslim or not a Muslim. And he also said that I am the protector of the religious, I am the defender of the religious minority on the day of judgment against the Muslim that aggresses against the religious minority. Uh, there's a lot, uh, it's a big question that you asked, uh, Senator Johnson, but basically the way I see it is that they are taking certain concepts or certain phrases and adding to it and appropriating to it new meaning that doesn't exist. For example, Nadia mentioned that one of the things they told her is that uh, Yazidis don't count as the people of the book, they're apostates. But the concept of the people of the book in Islamic law is not proscriptive, it's descriptive. It describes an organized religion that has a legal code, that has a, a book meaning a sort of a, a, a sacred text, so on and so forth. And as Muslims expanded eastward out of Arabia, they, they encountered Yazidis. These have been communities that have existed with Muslims and coexisted with Muslims since the first generation of Islam up until now. And all of the other Dharmic faiths, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Shintoism, Taoism, Confu all of these religions, Muslim scholars understood these as people of the book because it's a description, it's not proscriptive. So these differences is how they misunderstand certain things. Their basic, the basic axis around which this thinking exists is this concept of tekfirism, or declaring people to be apostates. I'm an apostate according to them, so therefore they can aggress against me. Why am I apostate? Because I don't agree with what they agree, I don't pledge allegiance to them, so on and so forth. And with this tactic, they go on and on and on. But one last thing Nadia mentioned when she asked Sheikh Al-Azhar, Dr. Ahmed Al-Tayyib in Cairo, why doesn't the senior leadership of Sunni Islam declare uh, ISIS as non-Islamic? Because I know this is a common question that I get. Our understanding of organizations like ISIS, it's even worse than apostasy, because there is no capital punishment for apostasy. The Prophet said that these people are khawarij, they are outliers. And in all of his mercy and all of his love and all of his beautiful teachings, he said, al khawarij ahl nar wa fi riwaya al khawarij kilab nar He said that the khawarij are the dogs of hellfire. And he said, Tuba liman qatalahum wa qatalu. Glad tidings to those that fight them and kill them and are killed in the process of killing them about the khawarij, about the outliers. So it's even worse, it's even more of a derogatory uh, a statement, a derogatory label than being an apostate. And uh, it is an obligation on all of us uh, in the family of Islam to do what we can uh, to combat it with whatever tools that we have at our disposal. 
Just one very quick question for you, the Ewer, Mr. Hassan. Of the, whatever, what is the Muslim population, 1.4 to 1.6 billion people, what percent of that population adheres to this barbaric ideology? Do you have any, do you have any sense of that whatsoever? For me? Either way. Wh whoever, whoever has an estimate. No, I, uh, you know, ISIS doesn't need a lot of numbers. Um, over, over the, uh, you know, we've seen this recently when they, when they start being put, like when uh, there is a force that pushes them, uh, pushes them in, in a certain area, they, uh, they, they can hold a territory like with uh, 200 people. Um, I think they are a, a very like, a small minority. Even within the Syrian rebel groups, they are still a, a, small, a smaller uh, group than others. But, they, but I think because of the sheer violence and brutality, they deter people. And they use the word uh, tashrid usually in their literature, which, which means uh, deterrence uh, with, with extreme violence, brutality. So when they kill one person, they make sure that uh, 100 or 1,000 people see uh, that person being killed. Senator Carper. Thank you. Uh, do we, did you say we have five minutes? Yeah, we're trying to. There's so many people here, so. Okay. The um, again, thank our thanks to each one of you for joining us today, and for sharing with us some uh, some parts of your life that are not easily shared. And we are deeply grateful to each of you, but especially to you, Nadia. Thank you. Um, here in the United States, we are, as you probably know, people of many different religions. We are Protestant, we are Catholic, we are Jew, we are Muslim, we are Hindu, we are Buddhist, and we are other uh, religions as well. And uh, one of the reasons why our country was established was because of the concept and nature of uh, freedom of religion. The people yearning to, not just to be free, but be free to worship God as, as they saw fit. There are some people who take the, the Bible, most people in, in America are probably uh, Protestant and Catholic, most, but certainly not all. But some, some people who take uh, verses of Scripture out of the Bible and they twist them into things in ways that they're not really meant to be uh, uh, done. And uh, there are people in our own faith who uh, bastardize uh, our faith. They cherry pick our faith. Uh, for a great example is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. People say take that as an admonition to go out and wreak vengeance on people that have wronged them. But that same verse of Scripture goes on to say, Revenge is mine, saith the Lord. Revenge is mine, saith the Lord. Um, there's another verse in Scripture that says, uh, uh, when I was a stranger in your land, did you take me in? And uh, we have uh, some people in this country, some political leaders, I don't know that they've read Matthew 25, whatever other the, the religion is, but there's some people in this country who have argued that the United States needs to stop accepting um, not just Syrian refugees, uh, but in some cases, all Muslim refugees. And in the case of the Syrian refugees, they would not allow us to accept. That include people who are not Muslim. They could be different faiths. They could be Christian. They could be uh, a Jew, a variety of, of, of religions. And uh, I would just ask, uh, maybe starting with you, uh, Mr. Al-Jawari, Al uh, I would uh, we'll start with you. And uh, just to ask, what are your opinions about a ban on, we'll say, all Syrian refugees? And how, or even all uh, Muslim refugees, and how uh, much, uh, how such a ban would affect uh, the ability in this country to counter ISIS propaganda and ideology. Would you go first? I'm not really trained as a politician, so. Neither are we. <laughs> <laughs> We're untrained. Uh, at, at the risk of saying, uh, making a political statement, I mean, I think. As an American, I, I understand. So my question is, my question is, what are your thoughts about how a ban on all Syrian refugees, or really all Muslim refugees, how does that uh, affect our ability as a country to counter ISIS propaganda and ideology? That's my well, question. Well, I was going to say, I think it's, as I understand our nation, I think it's un-American un not to accept the re refugees. Um, and we have a... Uh, I think a legal, uh, political, and, and more importantly, moral authority to take people in that we can. Uh, and this is what this, you know, e plur pluribus unum, this is what makes our nation great. And I think that from a social cohesion standpoint, uh, uh, societies that are more plural are, 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 are stronger. Um, I think that uh, by bringing in uh, refugees, uh, we will be able to understand the problem more and see how we can help them more. But I think. Uh, some sort of form of isolationism uh, or some sort of rejection will only increase the, increase the problem and, and make it fester more. 
Good, thanks. Other witnesses, please. Same question. Sure. I, uh, I can say two things. The, the first one is that, uh, you know, I, I try to keep in touch with people who uh, left Syria and they now live in Germany and other countries. And I've seen how uh, positive the message that the, the uh, European countries and the case of here, uh, um, only recently here, uh, that they accepted them, and that was a positive uh, sense. Like, you only hear good things from refugees. Uh, they praise the Germans and how hospitable they are and how, you know, so on and so forth. And the second thing is that uh, we have to recognize, uh, I think, uh, especially for the United States, that uh, thousands of Syrian refugees who left Syria and they're in Turkey, uh, in Europe or the United States have been instrumental in the, in the fight against ISIS. They provide intelligence, information, mapping, uh, uh, guidance, and, uh, uh, you know, ISIS operates in these areas that, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in eastern Syria, in uh, northeastern, uh, northeastern Syria, uh, and uh, northwestern Iraq. And these people have been uh, affected most by violence. They're driven out. And these, uh, the, uh, I mean, there is a reason why they were helpful in the fight against ISIS. That's all right, thank you. Anyone else, uh, Mr. Nahas? Just very briefly. Okay, from my experience as a refugee myself, go, that I went through the process, I could say that it's a very highly unlikely to, 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 for the process to let any terrorists that comes. It's a, it's a highly intense process, which takes security process checks, background checks, uh, waiting period for over like a year, at least a year, and t t witness, eyewitnesses, that they ask you a lot of personal questions, and t t for, for the slightest chance to let a terrorist or a, 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 a guy or a girl that believes in this, uh, these ideologies to pass through, it's highly unlikely. All right, thank you. Nadia, uh, do you have, could you briefly respond to my question? Very briefly, please. I would like first to say that every country has the right to protect itself and to protect its borders and its laws. But the people who are escaping from the religious discrimination and genocide, they should not face closed doors before them. Uh, I would like just to say that if the terrorists want to go someplace, they can go regardless of the process, and, and, and some of them have already immigrated. I, um, I think we have a, a moral imperative here. We face in this country a moral imperative uh, to be true to those words that are written at the Statue of Liberty. We have a moral imperative in uh, where they happen to be, whatever faith you have, we have a moral imperative to uh, Matthew 25. Uh, when you were a stranger, when you were a stranger in our land, did we take you in? But we also have a moral imperative to the people who live here and want to live in safety and be able to live to be old and have kids and grandchildren. And so well, I think our challenge here is to make sure that, that while we need to be true to our faith in allowing people who are in distress and on the run and uh, haunted by their memories, we need to be welcoming to them. We have to also at the same time have to be uh, mindful of the need to protect our safety. And sometimes they're in conflict with one another. Last thing I want to say, Mr. al Jawari, and you make a con con doctor can com comment on this later. But my understanding is every religion, just about every religion, including uh, Islam, has a golden rule: treat other people the way we want to be treated. Is that true? And then that is that not true of, of, of Islam? Yes, it is. My, my view is if, if all of us would sort of abide by that, since that's part of all the fabric of all of our religions, we'd be all be a whole lot better off on this planet. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Carper. So we equally went over. Now I think we need to keep it to five minutes to be respectful of all the people here. So Senator Ayotte. Uh, I want to thank I want to thank the chairman. I want to thank all of you for being here, um, in particular Mr. Nahas and, and Ms. Murad. Uh, we're so sorry for what you've gone through and your courage in coming forward here today is very important for us to hear uh, what you have endured and it's it's horrific but I wanted to follow up Miss Murad um, on the issue that actually you raised and I would like to have Dr. Al-Gawari comment on it 
And, and that is, um, Doctor, you, you said that um, what Daesh is doing is, is beyond apostate. It's, it's, you've described it as the dogs of hellfire. And um, I would agree with that description. <coughs> but what I want to understand is to what Ms. Murad asked, um, as we look at how the reaction should be um, from, for example, I, I think she may have identified the Al-Zahar Seminary in Cairo, which I believe you studied at, which is a very, very important seminary in Islam. Um, do you believe that uh, leaders in this seminary and other leaders uh, in the Muslim world have described and have called out Daesh in the way that you have described it today as forcefully as they should? Thank you, Senator. So just a correction. Th those are my words. I was quoting Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad said that the outliers are the dogs of hellfire. Right. Uh, which but, but, I, I but happen I to agree to ask, with. What I want to understand is, is to, answer, to, to really answer her question. Um, do you think that leaders in a position to influence, um, uh, influence what Islam truly stands for, um, do you think that they have been forceful enough in calling out whether you call them dogs of hellfire or apostate, however, uh, how Daesh is warping, um, as you've testified today, your religion. So I think there's uh, yes and no. I think there are definitely those uh, who are very outspoken. Uh, one, one scholar that comes to mind that, that we've worked with is uh, Sheikh Mohammed Yaqubi, himself a Syrian refugee for all intents and purposes, now living in Morocco. And he's written a very extensive fatwa uh, non-binding religious opinion uh, in English uh, against ISIS and he actually makes the argument which is a valid argument uh, that uh, Daesh or ISIS are in fact outside of the folds of Islam um, but if you've ever worked with scholars and academics they're a little bit slow on the uptake and not very good in front of the camera and I think that one we of the need leaders to say well that's one of the problems I think one of the uh, deficiencies one of the weak points of Al-Azhar is its uh, communications capacity. In a former life, I actually helped establish the Office of Communications for the Grand Mufti of Egypt uh, between 2003-2007 before I went to Princeton. And that was, wow, that was a coup. I mean, when I asked them, how do you deal with journalists? And they said, oh, we call the police and, and we arrest them. I said, no, 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 you have to work with the media because if you don't, what you're trying to say, what the Mufti's trying to say is not going to get out there. So I think there's a lot, a lot of training that can happen to help that. But I agree with you. There is more needs to be done uh, and more voices need to be heard. Thank you. Um, Ms. Murad, I, I, wanted, to, um, I wanted to say I, I, I believe that Daesh has engaged in war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. How important do you believe it is? You have put in your written testimony today, and you've also told us, um, how important is it for the United States to formally recognize Daesh's actions as genocide? And I mean with refer reference to the Yazidis and, and the, what you've told us today about how they're treating the Yazidis. It's very important for us that what happened to us to be acknowledged as a genocide. And on the 16th of this month, just a few days ago, when the UN acknowledged the genocide, for the Yazidis who have been hopeless for the past two years, this was the first time they started having some hope. <laughs> I would like these crimes to be legally recognized by you and I would like uh, to be acknowledged and I would like you to look into the crimes, the things that I've said today and the things that Daesh have done not secretly, they've publicly have said they will do it and they've did it and I would like you to, to look at these crimes and evidences. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here and I would just say um, 
There is a Senate resolution, Resolution 340, uh, which would call this for what it is, a genocide. And I hope that we can come together and declare, uh, I would like to see the administration declare this a genocide. And I also would like us as a Congress to come together and declare this for what it is. Thank you. Senator Tester. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of you for your testimony. Um, Dr. Elgwery, <clears throat> I came in uh, towards the last half of your comments, but one of the things you said right at the very end was that, I just want you to confirm this, ISIL has nothing to do with religion. Did I hear you right? ISIS has nothing to do with Islam, is I, what I believe I said. Okay, so tell me the difference real quick. I began by saying that is, uh, normative Islam and its Sunni and Shia expressions is defined by an interpretive methodology. Okay. And I walked through a little bit about the high, the high level of what that is. Right. And that the texts that we have, what we believe to be divine texts, live in time. And there's a discursive tradition in which how we interpret these, okay. these verses and these injunctions for the moment that we live in. But ISIS, they have no, they're not, they're unlettered, they're completely unlettered in the religion and the fundamentals of the religion, gotcha. nor do they have an interpretive methodology. So what they you. conclude is based on their own whims and desires from what they're reading prima facie without understanding the text itself. Okay, gotcha. So uh, I, I keep coming back to uh, why these guys exist. Um, uh, there's absolutely a criminal element because we saw that in Paris and we saw it in Brussels. Uh, the people belong to ISIL. There's also... Uh, doctors, engineers, uh, well-educated folks that are part of it uh, that, quite frankly, shouldn't, shouldn't be a part of a twisted uh, ideology as this. Uh, could, could you tell me what about their ideology appeals to that broad of a base of crooks and professionals and everything in between? So maybe Hassan will know more because he's actually interviewed some of them. But, I mean, intellectually or academically, I think that... Um, the first thing I would uh, point out is that I don't know if they necessarily f b believe in what ISIS is saying or they're coerced to believe in what ISIS is saying or what they're holding to be true. Um, I also think that... Coerced by force? Yeah, coerced by them, by ISIL and, you know, and what, whatnot. So you believe this or you're going to die? Yeah, exactly. That kind of coercion? As we heard from Nadia, for example, and, and others, other stories that have come out okay. from ISIL-controlled areas. Okay. I also think that there's a spectrum of extremism thought within Islam. Okay. Uh, and I think that it can start as something sort of innocuous, uh, but it's, there's something wrong with okay. that way of thinking, and it can slide. And I think that when they find somebody <laughs> that sort of looks like they're from central casting, they sort of just are able to pull them to that side. There's a lot of folks in that group, um, it appears to me anyway. Would you want to comment very briefly on that, on what, what, what makes it, or just agree with the doctor if he's correct? Yeah, I, I mentioned in the testimony before, uh, before his uh, that... Uh, the, the, the people who believe in the sort of ideology that ISIS believes in, as, as in they yeah. really believe in it, right. uh, are only uh, the two uh, categories. People who are young zealots who are indoctrinated by another category, which is of long-standing uh, <coughs> radicals yeah. who believe in takfirism, which is uh, declaring fellow Muslims as infidels, as apostates, yeah. Yeah. based on specific criteria that they, they have. They rely on books like, uh, the, there are two books that, I, um, that come to mind, I don't want to uh, get into uh, too much detail there, but there is a book, for example, that's uh, 1,000 uh, uh, pages of a man who, when he appears on TV and, and, and he explained his methodology of, uh, of, uh, of fatwa, he said uh, fatwa should not, be, uh, should not be done in the same way that Muslim clerics have done it uh, okay. over the centuries. All right. That I, as a person, I can <clears throat> declare you as a, 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 a fellow Muslim, as an apostate, based on my impression of you, how, if you work with the West against Muslims, Muslims, or if you uh, if you are an agent to a certain government, and so on and so forth. Okay. So their criteria are very postmodernist in, 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 in a way. Okay, back to you, Dr. Tariq. So, uh, are there statements or actions the U.S. has taken that might encourage people to be a part of ISIL? Say me. No, I'm Dr. Tariq. Oh, sorry. To be honest, that's a tough question for me to answer. Uh, I think that the rhetoric that comes out of ISIL sometimes makes us think that uh, if it were not for the U.S. invasion in Iraq, if it were not for the U.S. policy doing this or not the U.S. policy doing that, but the, the fact of the matter is that uh, one can make that argument for any other country. 
Uh, one could make that argument for any other regional player in that, in that region. And you know, politics is all based about interest, geopolitical interest and things like that. So I don't think that that's necessarily fair. I think because America is so dominant in the world and so out there, it's just an easy target and it's just easy, oh, well, if, you, if America just stopped doing this, then we'll stop doing right. that. But that's not going to happen. We know that. If we stop doing whatever they say, okay. they're, they're not going to change. All right. Well, <clears throat> my time is up. I want to thank you all for your testimony. I'll submit, um, well, I'll submit questions to the record if appropriate, Mr. Chairman. It will thank be. Thank you. Senator Heidkamp. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for such thoughtful comments and for such thoughtful words and such courage and bravery, especially our last two witnesses. Um, I think everyone here who frequently spends a lot of time on their smartphones during testimony sat and, and really listened and really um, you moved us all. Thank you so much for your courage and for the fact that you're survivors and as survivors you're willing to provide testimony as to the horror and um, as to the imperative that we all as good people need to um, engage. But I want to, um, for a minute, turn to our first two witnesses and just kind of engage in a discussion about message and messengers. Doctor, I was, I was fascinated by the work that you've done basically parsing um, kind of the perversion and responding to the conversion of Islam, or the perversion of Islam that is um, being done by uh, these radical groups um, and and obviously having met with with people who have been radicalized have a pretty good sense of you know what messages could we deliver that would actually make a difference especially in this country when now I think our greatest threat is radicalization of young men and women or or American citizens we've seen that now twice and so there's two parts of a message it's it's the right message and then the messenger. And I'm just going to make a couple points. I want both of you to respond to, to what you think the right message is and the right messenger. And I want to know if you've been, if you're familiar with what the Department of Homeland Security is doing today to try and provide a counter message and offer any advice to us as we review that in our role of, of oversight. And that'll be the last question I ask and I'd like that you both split up your time. Thank you. In terms of messaging, I, I think um, it's different because there, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's complicated because uh, ISIS should be treated as two organizations in one. There's the local one that it operates and has operates on the ground in Syria and Iraq and elsewhere, like in Libya and, and elsewhere, and they have uh, their own messaging, usually based on sectarianism. And there's the international one, which is, uh, which is very close to, uh, to Al-Qaeda. They, in fact, are trying to uh, recollect and regather the dispersed networks of Al-Qaeda uh, that were basically dispersed after the terrorist attacks of 9-11 uh, and the campaign against it. So they're trying very hard to do that in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, in the United States and elsewhere, but also in, uh, in North Africa. Uh, so the messaging should be different because they're different organizations. On the ground uh, and internationally, uh, uh, th there's this danger that what happens, on, like, uh, its appeal on the ground has become an international appeal. Why? Because it presented itself as some sort of uh, an idea that everyone is fighting and uh, the enemies of uh, this organization are the West or Iran or, or something else. You know, the, that this organization stands for something. So uh, the... The, the most effective uh, uh, messaging against this is to not talk too much about the, only the victims of ISIS outside the group that it claims to represent, but rather what's really happened on the ground, which is on a daily basis the group kills fellow Sunnis, people that, cla that it claims to represent, and uh, we don't see that uh, uh, in media, for example. The, next to, uh, to my village, the, uh, I mentioned they killed 700 people. Uh, only Washington Post, uh, Liz Sly, did a story about that. And that is, uh, a, a pro at the time, was the single most horrific massacre. Uh, uh, and they killed a lot of people, but they killed 700 people in a matter of days. Uh, that needs to be uh, the message that, look, this is not an organization, not, not a sectarian organization, not an organization that represents a sect, or it's not an Islam versus uh, the West. It is a crazy organization, it's an extremist organization that recasts itself in religious uh, terms that the people of that faith rejected. Uh, and uh, that needs to be uh, hammered again and again. As far as messaging, I think there needs to be a, an unequivocal 
counter narrative from Muslim religious leaders. Um, no wishy washy stuff, no, well, maybe there's five opinions on that. There's yes, no, black, white. There's right Islam, there's wrong Islam, period. Uh, what I've been trying to do in our organization in Word is I, I conduct a monthly a traditional class we call Al-Halaqa, and I try to take one of the concepts that organizations like ISIL uphold, and I try to deconstruct it in a very detailed way. And my goal, obviously the audience is primary Muslim, but my goal is for young Muslim people to understand why it's wrong, why there's a perversion in their thinking. Uh, not that I'm saying I'm the example, but I think that kind of effort is, is what we need more of. And I think uh, that the English language is actually very important in this regard because a lot of the media that we've been seeing coming out of ISIL is in English and it, and it appeals. So I think that's very important. As far as uh, recommendations, um, some of the things that, that come to mind, uh, for example, in our home county of Montgomery County in Maryland, we've noticed a, a, a drastic increase in bullying towards Muslim students. Uh, in the Montgomery County public school systems. And I think that anti-bullying work is very important so that our children feel safe in schools, so that they're not pushed uh, to the side, so they're not uh, isolated. Uh, also, in our organization, we work with uh, helping refugees resettle, and I think those type of services are very important so that uh, people like Subhi and Nadia, others that are coming as refugees, um, they, have a, they have something to plug into so they're not, sort of not left to dr drift uh, in the wind. So those are the, some of the things. And sorry, w one last thing. Um, I think that media training for Muslim leaders abroad is also very important. And I think there's a lot of good people. There's a lot of, uh, I can't remember the, who we were talking about earlier. There's a lot of good leaders that are making the right argument, but we need to, they need to know how. You can't, you can't write a 40-page legal opinion and expect that to be trending on Twitter. It's just not going to happen. And when I told my teachers that, they're like, well, w what we're saying is the, is the dumbed-down version of what our teachers said. I said, okay, we have to stop the humility thing and we have to be smart about how we inject this message into the media because there's a certain way that media works. So media training, I think, is very, very important. Social media, that kind of thing for leaders abroad. Thanks, Senator Heinkamp. Again, I, I want to be sure everybody gets questions, so I'll ask everybody to be mindful of the five-minute limit. Uh, Senator Peters. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for our witnesses uh, here today. And Ms. Rod and uh, Mr. Nahas, uh, thank you for your very compelling uh, testimony and uh, your journey here to this country. Uh, it's very important as we discuss uh, refugees uh, and folks like yourself who have been fleeing intense persecution and terror, that people see the, the human face of uh, refugees who are in this country. Uh, your presence here today uh, uh, is important, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, many people will see that and be as moved as I know everybody on this panel has been moved uh, by your testimony. So thank you for your courage uh, to be here today. Dr. Um, El-Gawari, um, I, I would like you to respond uh, to what seems to be somewhat of a debate back and forth we're hearing in the, in the political realm now as to whether or not we should call uh, ISIS uh, radical uh, Islam. When, when you hear someone calling it radical Islam, is, do you think that's an accurate description uh, of uh, what we're seeing with ISIS? They seem to be intent on getting all the difficult questions. Um, one of the things they taught us at seminary is that there is no, um, there is no, um, I'm just trying to translate in my head on the fly. There is no, there's nothing wrong with labels because a lot of times we get stuck on labels. Well, why are you saying this? Why are you calling that? And I think that labels are only what their, de what their definition is. When somebody says, I use that term radical Islam, and I know a lot of people in my community get upset. But what I mean by it is people that look Muslim, say they're Muslim, quoting the Quran and doing horrible things. I and mean, what are we going to call them? They're, they are terrorists for sure. But they're very, they're very different than, you know, a neo-Nazi group, for example. So I personally don't have a problem with that. When people say that, whether, you know, Congress or the White House or in the media, I understand what is meant. However, I fear that that can very easily slide into well, any form of religiosity from a Muslim is a form of radical Islam. And that's, I think, where the fear is, is that we limit it to what it's supposed to define. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hassan. 
It's a good question because personally, uh, you know, when I was in the UAE last year, uh, I was an advocate of using these terms and uh, uh, pressing on clerics to speak up against this organization. Uh, I remember the late uh, Saudi king uh, who died two years ago, he uh, uh, admonished a clerics, the high clerics, for the first time in public, and he said, I feel you're lazy, you're not speaking up against uh, ISIS when, when, it, when it came up, when it came out. But uh, I think when I moved to the UK last year, uh, I felt that there, uh, the, 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 uh, there's, a, there's a question of messenger. Who, is, who says this term and why? Uh, and, and it's important to keep, uh, to keep this in mind. Uh, Paul, ISIS wants to divide. This is, this is the, the, the thing that the ISIS did in the Middle East, and it's trying to do it elsewhere. It wants to polarize its enemies, and it wants to polarize the society under, uh, under, under its control, and they want to divide their enemies. And they've succeeded uh, in, in the Middle East, and they're probably succeeding here by, by uh, getting people busy to, talking about what to call it and what not to call it. I think what's clear is that this organization is... Uh, like doctor said, uh, declared war on Islam. Uh, this is uh, how it should be seen. It's, it's a problem within, within the Islamic world, and it needs to be dealt there. And uh, here, what uh, can be done is to help um, Muslims fight this organization. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, the issue that we face here in the United States in, in dealing uh, with uh, this uh, threat uh, deals with lone wolves, folks who may be inspired uh, by what they see in, in the ideology. Uh, is, is it safe to say the folks who may be inspired by this are folks who really have very little understanding of Islam? Is there a correlation there? Uh, and uh, does that have something to do with uh, this recent shooter who was claiming allegiance, I believe, to ISIS, but also at some point uh, Hezbollah and how that may be inconsistent? And if you could kind of address uh, what may be going on in the minds of lone wolves, so things that we should be considering as to how we respond to this uh, phenomenon? So I would say absolutely. People that uh, self-radicalize, uh, just like the radicals that we've been speaking about this morning, they, they have very little to no understanding of the religion whatsoever. Um, and that's really the danger. And part of that is that they have no training, they have no you know, living teacher that they can sit with, they can ask questions, and this discursive, uh, interpretive uh, tradition that I described earlier takes place. Um, so I think that that's definitely uh, a fear, you know, people that are surfing online, you know, finding a lecture here, finding a statement there, cutting and pasting these together and formulating some kind of conclusion uh, and, and acting uh, on it. I definitely think is, it's, it's, it's a problem. Um, and I think that more instruction, more uh, religious literacy for Muslims will help in that regard. Okay. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to um, add my words of, of appreciation and thanks to our panel. Very, very powerful testimony. Thank you for being here. Um, wanted to start, I know the hearing is about the ideology of ISIS, of Daesh, and yet it was called in the wake of a, an, an horrible tragedy in Orlando that was at once um, a terrorist inspired attack and also a hate crime in this case against uh, members of the LGBT community. Um, it was also Latin night at the club and it's unclear whether that was uh, contributing uh, to the targeting of, of the club on that particular night. Um, Mr. Nahas, when you were testifying, you shared with us that uh, attacks against LGBT Syrians preceded the formation of ISIL, that uh, it was uh, called for or tolerated or uh, perpetrated by the regime as well as militants who opposed the regime in, in Syria, um, that, that they too perpetrated violence against um, LGBT Syrians. Um, in the U.S., uh, violence, bullying, uh, intimidation, uh, discrimination against members of the LGBT community has a long history also. Um, and in the early days, uh, you 
could certainly argue that it was sanctioned at one point in our nation's history by the government also. Um, but things have changed. I, I, and I, I want to just draw attention to something you highlighted in your testimony about the UN Security Council acting very recently to recognize that LGBT rights are human rights. Um, a first in, in that international forum, you highlighted it as something that is very important in moving forward. I, I, I guess I, I want to ask um, in terms of, of your proposals, your recommendations to this committee and to others, how important it is for governments, for authorities, for regimes to say LGBT rights are human rights. Um, and how dangerous is the absence of that, the silence to that? Thank you, Senator, for this important question. I, from my own experience growing up as a gay man in Syria, I know that the, the, I knew at an early age that the government has laws against us and we're not, uh, my existence was not legal. So I was not allowed to say it out loud. I was not allowed to be out in the open. It was uh, punishable up to three years in prison. This is the least and at worst that it could be persecuted by your own community members. So it's very important for us to put the words out there, to, to say to the government and hold them accountable, to tell them that this is, LGBT rights are human rights. They are not, as, as my, from my understanding, my community and traditions say that LGBT rights are only sexual rights. They're, they don't relate at all to human rights. And to make this message clear to governments, to, and communities in their governments, it's very important to, rel to at least start to elevate the consequences that I witnessed in my country where we're being bullied all the time, persecuted, harassed in the streets, even verbally uh, and physically abused. And it, we could not go anywhere. We could not go to the police. We could not tell our families. Because if we do, they will persecute us more because they will always say, you have to man up and defend yourself. This is not an issue that you can talk about. But if, if these international like platforms were used in a proper way to, to deliver the message, to tell the governments that these rights should be addressed properly, it's, it's, it delivers a very strong message. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up at, oh, I'm yeah, out of you, time. If you do it for the record. Uh, uh, so a question for the record then. Um, Senator Peters, was asking questions about uh, self-radicalization and lone wolves. And I think in the case of Orlando, it, it is not clear how um, deep of, a, of an understanding the, um, the, the perpetrator, the gunman, had with um, isolated, appeared to have relationships online with various uh, terrorist organizations. But I guess I want to ask an even broader question about self-radicalization because we have seen in recent um, instances of mass gun violence in the U.S. Um, people who were self-radicalized but inspired by different types of hatred, um, uh, hatred of um, a minority religion, as we saw in Wisconsin, Mr. Chairman, when um, a, a gunman entered the Sikh temple in Oak Creek, uh, as we saw in, in Charleston, uh, motivated by uh, racial hatred. Um, what can we learn about self-radicalization in studying those who have been self-radicalized by ISIL? Uh, when dealing with self-radicalization um, uh, for people who hold different types of, of hatred. And, and the witnesses can answer that in, in written responses. Uh, Senator Langford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate your uh, bravery in coming forward and your courage uh, to be able to speak out. Uh, these are important days and we need to be able to hear clear, articulate voices. And uh, I thank you for bringing that. Mr. Hassan, let me ask you, what is the end goal 
for ISIS? What, what do they see on the horizon? They are fighting for what, and they will know they have achieved it when? Well, they say they are, they want a, a, a caliphate that dominates the world. This is their uh, stated uh, mission. Uh, they, uh, I think their uh, realistic um, objective is to control Syria, Iraq, and expand in the region and become this leader of jihad and global jihad. Uh, they, uh, that's why they spent so much effort on uh, uh, targeting Al-Qaeda. They, they are more, more critical of Al-Qaeda than probably other, other ones uh, because they, uh, they see them as, as their competitors and their rivals. Uh, so their, their, their goal is uh, regional dominance, but uh, obviously they want to um, uh, expand in the West and elsewhere. So you talk about the regional dominance, yet they're trying to motivate people in Western countries, whether it be in Europe, United States, Australia, wherever it may be, to be able to fight and attack in those locations as well. Uh, so why try to motivate people in Australia or in the United States or in Europe to be able to fight for them if the goal is the caliphate there? Yeah, well, I mean, listen to, to them and how they talk, uh, reading their books, the, the books that they say they read, uh, uh, pamphlets and so on. They, they talk about the war uh, today, and this is important, I think, for the anti-ISIS campa campaign today because they, uh, there is this tendency to think about tactical defeats as uh, strategic uh, defeats against, uh, defeat against ISIS. And that's, that's not true. ISIS presents itself as uh, it's a long-term project. They talk about Nikaya uh, as, as a tactic, which is a war of attrition. So they want to uh, exhaust the West, exhaust everyone else. They think uh, 10 years ago we were fighting the, the Americans. The Americans were in Iraq and they, were, uh, they had the appetite to fight us. Uh, 10 years later, uh, President Obama had little appetite or less appetite to fight us. In 10 years' time, uh, that would be uh, even less. They, uh, they, they have a core, and that's a, uh, the most important uh, part of ISIS, a core that is mostly uh, consistent of uh, uh, security officials. These are the most dangerous people. Uh, many of them were former uh, members of uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, Mohabarat or appar uh, security apparatus, they uh, shape the organization in terms of how it operates and how it works and how it ensures its survival. Uh, so I think they, they have that goal. That core won't go away. Uh, you could defeat the organization, uh, defeat the members who joined it two years ago and, and so on, but they think of their uh, long-term strategy as a strategy of Nikaya or uh, war of attrition. Okay, so if you go back 15 years ago or 10 years ago, the United States was talking and challenging, and the West was challenging leadership in Islam to call out al-Qaeda, which was happening, and to say that is not consistent. Now it is a challenge towards ISIS or Nusra Front or whoever it may be, and to say that does not line up with theology. How does, we see this springing up in multiple areas around the world, this, what you term, use the term, it's a, I think it's a very familiar term, this radical Islam is twisting off. But it, it's not just around ISIS. It's around mostly ISIS today, but could be Nusra Front, could be Al-Qaeda, could be others. Uh, it's a more broad system. Uh, so is it a uh, confront ISIS, or is it a confront a larger uh, set of uh, teachings that's separate from traditional Islam? Well, that, that's the difference between uh, defeating the organization tactically. You can launch, launch military, uh, a very effective military campaign uh, against it, and you can defeat it. You can uh, expel it from Mosul, Raqqa, Haditha, uh, sorry, uh, Fallujah. But uh, the, organization, uh, the organization's appeal and the spectrum, the broader appeal of groups like it, like-minded groups like Al-Qaeda, uh, other Islamist groups that believe in violence and long term, like as a strategic uh, goal rather than violence for, uh, just because they're pushed to vi violence. Does the worldwide uh, movement of ISIS um, uh, diminish if they do not have a functioning caliphate in Syria and in Iraq? It will, but the fear, I think we've reached a point today uh, where what, what's happening on the ground in Iraq and Syria doesn't affect so much the international appeal of ISIS. And this is, I think, directly because the campaign against ISIS has not been done properly. 
uh, using the wrong vo forces to fight ISIS in towns that the, the, these organizations are, are, are viewed suspiciously is a disastrous campaign, uh, campaign that even State Department officials complained about it and said uh, in, in that letter, the dissent uh, document saying, uh, for example, allowing the YPG, which is an organization affiliated to the PKK in Turkey, which is design designated by the U.S. as a terrorist organization, uh, using that organization to fight ISIS, another terrorist organization, in Sunni Arab areas, that's just wrong. So I think the campaign today uh, 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 is allowing ISIS to, to convert uh, territorial losses into legitimacy in that region specifically. And that's why I've been warning uh, time and again that the campaign is not being done properly. It's only making ISIS stronger. Thank you. Senator Booker. Yeah, I, I think Senator Lankford's line of questioning is really right on, and I'd like to pick up uh, right where he left off. And so first of all, you, 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 know, you say in your testimony, um, you know, uh, you can defeat the group in Raqqa, Mosul, Fallujah, but these defeats will remain tactical unless this group is discredited by the same people it claims to represent. Could you go a little deeper than that? So what, what specifically then are you advising for us to do as we get these, we're, we're shrinking their territory clearly, but it seems like you're saying that we're giving them more strength in some ways in the way that we're doing it. Can you be a little more specific it's, about what you're suggesting? That's the question. I think we defeated ISIS, uh, if I want to speak uh, uh, as uh, the other side. ISIS was defeated in Iraq in 2006 after the surge. Uh, but ISIS came back and took Mosul. It was defeated in two th from 2006 to 2010. It was a very marginal organization in Iraq, uh, Sunni Arabs uh, that in the areas that ISIS operated in, defeated the organization, worked with the Americans uh, and policed their areas. That worked. But then the policy that followed in 2010 when, we, uh, when uh, Iraq... Um, when, when, uh, when the United States pulled out of Iraq before Iraq was able to govern itself, and uh, uh, because there was support, perceived support between, bet uh, 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 between the U uh, cooperation between the U.S. and Iran to work with Maliki, who is a sectarian uh, prime minister, and uh, work with him despite the fact that he was weakened, and there are, there's a rival, another sh uh, Shia rival who is more moderate and more uh, uh, tolerant, was supported. And then, uh, so uh, the, um, the, the mistakes that followed, that, that very uh, success, that success between 2006 and 2010 led to circumstances that enabled ISIS in 2012 to tell all Sunnis in these areas, look, the only way forward is to, for us to work together and uh, reject this uh, government from our area. And they were able to uh, rally people, mobilize people against this government. And that's why they were able to take Mosul in 2014, uh, in the summer of 2014, took Mosul, uh, 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 forced the Iraqi army to drop its arms and flee. And they took massive weaponry, the American weaponry. And they went back, marched back into Syria. And they took their Zor and, and uh, fortified Raqqa. And they took some of Hasak and so on. They became a strong organization because uh, b the political failures uh, uh, that there. And my fear is that uh, there is so much focus on the military uh, component rather than on the political and social and uh, uh, religious dimensions uh, to, the, to, to what's going on there. And, and so I, I see your point, and I also appreciate in your testimony discussing how we in the West should be trying to discredit um, uh, uh, or have Islamic voices discrediting um, uh, 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 dash, and, I, and maybe that gets me to your testimony, which I thought was really uh, uh, wonderful, discussing all the ways that they're perverting Islam in their in their uh, in 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 their in the way that they're waging their war, um, and and taking advantage of our political and uh, failures in terms of how we're gaining territory, and so this is not a clash of civilizations. This is uh, people perverting Islam. And, 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 and taking advantage of uh, uh, political realities. Uh, and, and so I, I just want to get from you, and you said this already, but I want to go one step deeper. Um, for us, who focus so much on CVE efforts here in the Senate, w what are the specific tactics then to start to expose um, uh, ISIL for, what they're, what, for the perversions that they're doing and discredit them? What are some of the best ways to go about that? Thank you, Senator. Um, I think I really believe in the counter-narrative. 
Um, and that's very, very important because when I started to do this, you know, less than a year ago, I realized that there's no very articulate, very clear-cut counter-narrative. And by counter-narrative, I mean, you know, how are we going to, how does Islam deal with issues of plurality? How do we deal with issues of democracy, citizenship, uh, constitutional nation states? All of these things have been argued in the last two, three hundred years by Muslim jurists, but unknown to the vast majority of Muslims. So a lot of the issues that Daesh, ISIL, whatever, uh, claim are the, the bones that they're picking with modernity really have been dealt with already. It says the memo hasn't been passed around. So the counter-narrative is effective because it's d d steeped in very rigorous, authentic scholarship. Uh, it's d based on the primary sources, the Quran, the Sunnah, which are very important for, for Orthodox And Dr. Muslims. I'm going to interrupt you there because be mindful of my time. And that's helpful. And I, and I hope you'll make yourself available if we have further questions. I just want to say in my remaining 10 seconds uh, to Mr. Nahas and uh, Ms. Murad, I, your, your testimony was so courageous. Uh, and so moving. Um, the outrageous uh, attacks going on against uh, LGBT uh, um, people in the Middle East and here in the United States, which as you point out in your testimony is the most common types of hate crimes we see. I'm grateful for your honesty and your courage, Ms. Murad, is uh, really uh, just so profound and I'm grateful that you would come here today and, and share your story, which is so important to be heard. Thank you very much. Thanks, Senator Booker. I actually want to kind of pick up on both the, you know, Senator Langford and Senator Booker's line of questioning, just in terms of, you know, what's been the reality situation in terms of where, where is ISIS right now, in terms of, you know, success or lack of success against it. Um, there's a State Department report, it's called the START Report, Study Terrorism, Response Terrorism, very, very difficult numbers there. They're very inaccurate. They're changing all the time. But uh, when I looked at, and I did a little calculation, the number of, globally, the number of people killed in terrorist attacks prior to 9-11 is a little under 5,000. You know, with updated numbers, that, that's grown, you know, five, six, seven times. So th this, is a, this is a real, and from my standpoint, a growing threat. Uh, ISIS, uh, the news reports show that outside of Syria, ISIS-inspired attacks that have cost 1,191 lives in was that just last two years, last year. Um, the analogy I've been using in terms of, and I, I realize we've made some progress, okay, we've taken back some territory, but they still control territory. And the analysis I'm somewhat using is that of a beehive. You might have a beehive in your backyard, you can poke it with a stick and do damage to the hive, but you're also stirring up the hive. Is that what we're witnessing? And what is the danger there? And isn't it true that we have to, we do have to defeat ISIS, we do have to deny them that territory, we have to deny them that caliphate, but then We've got a lot of mopping up to do. And these Islamic terror groups, if anything, they're spreading, they're growing, they're evolving, they're metastasizing. You know, it is like a cancer. And we're not winning this battle, Mr. Hassan. Well, I'm uh, coming from the position that uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda are uh, growing, and there will, there will be other groups that join them, so they are on a trajectory of uh, expanding uh, for, the, for the next decade or, or, or even two. Uh, and it's important, I think, at, the, at this moment, ISIS is being uh, rolled back. It's being defeated territorially in Iraq and Syria. Like uh, the statistic mentioned uh, before, 50% in Iraq, they lost 50% of their territory in, in Syria. They lost 20% of their ter territory in, uh, in, uh, in Libya. They're also on the, on the back foot. Uh, and in Libya, they're, tr they're, they're struggling to even establish any presence there. Al-Qaeda is, is doing very well in uh, in Yemen. Uh, the same thing in Afghanistan, they're not doing very well there. So th their capacity currently is limited. However, I think their, their, the, the ability to inflict uh, damage uh, is, is strong. Uh, they benefit from the open space, obviously, on, uh, on the internet, the, the self-radicalization. You, uh, you can become self-radicalized by watching a video by Anwar al-Awlaki, the American citizen who uh, was killed in a drone attack in 2011, I think. Uh, you know, it's very easy to become uh, one, one of them. Uh, the, the radicalization, the sort of radicalization that that leads uh, someone to ISIS is swift and animating, meaning uh, they can push a person in a very short time to do some, uh, some damage. It's very hard to predict it, uh, but it's, it's there. It's a, it's a danger that will remain for us. But for a short while. answer. I mean, the, the gains were, were rolling up in, in Syria and Iraq. Does that give you much comfort? Because you're, you're saying this is a long-term project. This is, you, you think they're growing in strength over the next decade or two. Yeah, and briefly, uh, th that's good. 
the problem is the other tracks, the political track, the uh, social, religious, and uh, w uh, w uh, you know, the political process in Iraq and Syria, the conflict, uh, is lagging behind. Uh, if they are catching up to the military advance, advances, then uh, ISIS will, will go away for a while. But for now, the problem is the focus uh, on a military while you neglect the other things is a problem. Dr. El Gawari, um, I want to shift a little bit to, to the Muslim Brotherhood. I think it's oftentimes reported as maybe more moderate group. Do you have any thoughts about uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood? I have a lot of thoughts about the Muslim Brotherhood and like groups. Um, I think that goes back to what I was trying to say earlier, the concept of a spectrum. And I think these Islamist groups, while some of them are on the very left of the spectrum, while some of them are not necessarily open to violence, there are certain procedural changes if those took places, if certain boxes were ticked on the form, violence then would be authorized. I mean, look at what's happened in Egypt, my, my home country, country of my family. So I think that I'm, I'm always shocked, utterly shocked, at how engaging our government is of organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood, quite frankly. And when I, spoke to, when I speak to people in the embassy in Cairo, when I was living there for a while, and I say, why don't you engage with Muslim leaders? And they're like, we do. We, we engage with so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so, and, -so, and they give me a drop-down list of all these Islamist Muslim Brotherhood activists. So I think there's a, there's a big mismatch, and I think by engaging with them so openly and so freely, we almost legitimize that... Um, uh, that approach. Um, so I think that it's dangerous. I think it's definitely on the spectrum, but it does not necessarily, it's not an, an, an nece a necessity that it will go from one end of the spectrum to another, but it's definitely on the spectrum that I'm concerned about. Senator Carper. Thanks. Uh, again, we thank uh, each of you for, uh, for being with us today and spending this time with us and sharing your, your thoughts uh, with, uh, with us and your, and your advice as, as well. I am um, uh, I want, to, uh, I want to start with a, a question. I think I'll start, Mr. Hassan. I'll uh, start with you, but then um, invite other witnesses to, to respond too. But in, um, uh, in, I think in your testimony, you wrote that the United States must highlight uh, that the war with ISIS is not a sectarian conflict. That's pretty much what you said, I think. And you point out that there are Muslims of both Shia and uh, Sunni Islam joining Christians, joining Jews and joining people of all religions and ethnic backgrounds in fighting ISIS. Uh, with that said, some people here in the U.S. are trying to paint this as a, a battle against, this battle against ISIS is a broad clash between the West and with, uh, with Islam. Uh, I think our president's made it clear that he believes this kind of rhetoric is dangerous and it is patently false and it plays directly into the hands of ISIS. And I would just ask, that, do you agree with this? I agree that, uh, you know, I, I, this is not a sectarian war, and uh, this is not a war, uh, I, again, uh, I mean, it's not an Islam uh, versus West uh, war. In fact, if anything, the war, ISIS, is all about uh, uh, Muslims versus Muslims. This is what the ideology is built on. Uh, if you track, I mean, we can talk about ideas and ideology, but if you, uh, uh, practically speaking, like the way that ideology of ISIS has matured and become um, uh, kind of uh, 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 framed was, uh, was a reaction to what the events that happened after the Iraq war. Not the Iraq war itself, but how, for example, Sunnis reacted to the presence of Americans on the ground and they started declaring these people as apostates and what's the punishment for these people. So they, tried, they, they started to appropriate uh, events in Islamic history to uh, the context that, that's going on here. So it wasn't at all about the West. It's about, uh, okay. it's about what's going on on the ground in, in the Muslim, Muslim world. Thank you. Uh, Dr. al Gawari. Uh, again, the question is, do you, do you agree that sort of portraying this war as a, uh, against ISIS as a war against Islam plays uh, directly into the hands of ISIS or, or not? I mean, I sort of agree with what Hassan was saying. I think, uh, if anything, the victim of, of ISIL is, is Islam itself. Um, and they have definitely declared war on our, our scholars, our normative tradition, our Sunni and our Shia sects. Uh, and that's the, the biggest tragedy. And I don't think that, uh, and I think that our best allies uh, in this are normative Muslims that are people like me. I mean, I'm, I'm, my life is in threat just by being here, speaking out against this. Um, and, and I don't say that lightly. 
And I think that I want to stop that but more probably than you do. I mean, I really want this to end, and I want to know what I can do uh, to push that forward. And I think in that desire is the greatest ally we have to, to, to counter the, uh, the, the rhetoric and the ideas that are coming out of ISIL. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Nahas, same question, please. Yeah, I'm sorry I don't have the capacity to answer this question. All right. Uh, Nadia, do you want to uh, respond to that question, please? Do you agree that painting this war against ISIS as a war against uh, uh, ISIS that plays Islam is a war against Islam that plays directly into the hands of ISIS? And inadvertently, we're helping ISIS by portraying this as a war against is Islam. Aftishna namusada daash teakirin. Aftishna hamakir. مچو گهاند بری هر چتگی پشتی امریکا مگهاند مصر مگهاند کوید کو از جمن عوان شبابا بک مجبر از انسان کبوان داعش را عیش موم اشوان فیهم کر The first thing I did I went to Egypt and to Kuwait to deliver that message because the things that happened to me I wanted to go to these countries and to tell them what happened to me شوهك از بيجم وان جريمة شوهك بيجم هدف داعش چه فكره وي چه جريمة تا كمت كرين چه I want to prevent the youth from joining the Islamic State. I went and I told them what crimes were committed, what actions, what ideology they had. I want to stop the flow of the youth to them. Speaking against this is not help for Daesh. You have to speak against it. Also, minimizing the role of Daesh or the power is not right because only ISIS border is more than 3,000 miles and they protect it all. There are ten, tens of thousands are fighting for them. Some of our villages are only 150 people are living in small villages. We have not been able to, to recapture these villages for a year and a half. So how about the big cities? It's not a small power. Speaking against ISIS does not mean speaking against Islam and also does not mean speaking uh, in favor of Sunnis or Shias one against another. When we all speak together against this, then we are united, then we can defeat it. Uh, my time is expired. Mr. Chairman, you and I are both supporting legislation that would uh, uh, strengthen the ability of the Department of Homeland Security to, uh, to reach out to faith communities, to, to reach out to civic groups, parents, community leaders in order to prevent ISIS from recruiting Americans, which we believe is the greatest threat that we, that we face. And if, if I could just have 30 seconds and ask uh, D uh, Dr. al Jawari, what advice would you have for the Department of Homeland Security as they put together and implement this outreach to, to a broad community to, to focus on reducing the likelihood that people will be radicalized here? Just one, maybe one strong piece of advice to the Department of Homeland Security. Work with us. Okay. Thank you. And Senator Carper, I will give all the witnesses a chance to just have a closing comment after we go to Senator Booker, but I do want to quick ask Nadia a quick a question. Uh, who helped you escape? I like a Muslim. A Muslim family. I think that answers the question. Senator Booker. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, Senator Carper, um, Dr. Uh, his point of question, which you said, uh, help us basically uh, help you, um, but we're looking at a specific efforts that have been going on to activate lone wolves in the United States, uh, 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 cells in Belgium and France, um, and, and, and this is the part of the war that uh, uh, obviously hits uh, Western countries right where they are, being preached at, uh, where, where, um, where citizens of those countries and American citizens are finding the ISIS ideology and the perversion of Islam uh, so compelling 
um, that they're willing to take up arms against their fellow citizens in Europe or in the United States of America. And clearly, we're doing a lot already trying to uh, empower local organizations in our communities, working with mosques. And we've had uh, panels here where, where folks have given testimony about that. We now have allocated more resources toward that. I've been one of the people that's saying CVE efforts should not be law enforcement focused. They should be focused on empowering communities, empowering those networks. If CVE becomes just more police, more surveillance, and more of that, it, it, it's not going to really help us uh, really deal with the core of the problem. And what I found so compelling about you is you pointed out so clearly in a way that I learned a lot from your testimony, so clearly that um, this is a perversion of Islam. This is not Islam we're fighting against. This is people that are using it uh, to, to fuel hatred, violence, and, as Hassan Hassan said, tactically for political objectives, to control territory, um, uh, and to expand uh, the reach of their uh, to totalitarian ends. But my concern is I, I, I still think we need to be doing more, um, frankly, a lot more, um, to counter that narrative. And uh, the, the, I liked what you said in one of your responses, that another paper, uh, uh, another 150-page paper, is not that effective against the memes that you often see online uh, that often seduce and pull in uh, uh, sort of vulnerable souls to this kind of uh, terroristic activity. So I understand your sort of short answer to a short question, um, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out what are the specific strategies, and we're seeing some of them that are, that are working, where you expose the fact that uh, ISIL is killing far more Muslims, killing far more Sunnis than they are killing people in, in the West. Um, that really begin to expose this so that, they're, uh, so that those young people who might be susceptible to them see them for who they are, uh, uh, naked before their eyes. Um, uh, and, and, and those are the kind of strategies that we need to start really investing in more. And so in, in the two minutes I left you in the three-minute pre preamble, um, could, you, could you go uh, really to the core of those things that if you were invest making the investments in the budgets that we have to oversee, where would you be placing those dollars more specifically? We have a very successful model in Montgomery County called the Brave Model. It's a public-private partnership. We work with law enforcement. We, look with the, we work with the county executive. It's a really good program. It's getting national recognition. We're trying to export this model, train other people in other counties in the country that need this type of message. What I do in this model is I do a lot of the counter-narrative. I would love to be able in a position where I can train other young Muslim leaders in this country and our counterparts in Western Europe on what these points of the, I did the research, I'm happy for them to take it, I'm happy to, for them to say they did it. I, I, I don't, maybe my colleagues will be upset about that, but I'm happy for people just to get the message out there. I also mentor people, people that might be on the spectrum that are referred to us by uh, law enforcement, the school board, they might be on the spectrum, but there's no capacity for local government to deal with them. I sit down with them. I talk with them. I try to decipher, is there a problem? Are they on this, the spectrum? Is it a mental health issue? Then we try to refer them out to county-wide programs that will help them. So this, this public-private partnership is working. It's working in our county. And I think if, if I had you know, some say on the purse strings, I would like to see us to, to be in a position to train other counties first in the country where it's needed the most, and I would like us to go overseas, Western European cities like Brussels, London, and work with our counterparts over there to train them in this model. And, and that's a proactive strategy that often save a lot of money on the reaction that we have to do with law enforcement or, God forbid, something happening. Uh, today, you, your all testimonies have been testimonies of courage, which you said people should understand, that you are risking your life uh, uh, by coming here, by speaking truth, uh, uh, by laying bare uh, the evil um, that we are up against. And for that, I, I am deeply grateful. Thanks, Senator Booker. And you are right. I mean, just, just think of the evil that people are threatening somebody speaking the truth of their lives. Uh, again, I'd like to offer all the witnesses about a minute to just make a final comment, and we'll start with you, Mr. Hassan. We uh, sort of covered uh, uh, most of the ground, but I want to just emphasize that uh, we all need to show uh, ISIS 
you know, show what it is on the ground, like what it does to, uh, to the people that it claims to represent. Uh, we need to emphasize that these are its victims as much as the, the others are. Uh, and uh, I think that needs to be present in the media. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's, not, it's not one person's war, it's everyone's war. Hey, Mr. Son. By the way, doctor, you got the harder questions because you're, you got doctor in front of your name. <laughs> but doctor. It's actually at the end of the name on the... On the... <laughs> Uh, Senator Johnson, Senator Carver, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee, uh, to submit testimony uh, about something that is much more than work. Um, this is something very personal. Um, I, think, I think of my children when I come here and how the rhetoric, even though they're young, the political rhetoric, unfortunately, is something that scares them. And I hope that what we're doing here will help build a more resilient homeland so that the America that they grow up in will be better than the America that I grew up in. Thank you. Mr. Haas. Thank you, uh, Senators, for the opportunity for allowing me to speak in front of you. And every time that I have the chance to speak and talk about my experience, I always think about my counterparts that are still in danger, that are still under a threat, especially because of their because they are different, because they are not as, they don't confirm with other people's expectations. And I hope that the United States will take a stand and will be more active, like in holding government and other actors on the ground accountable for their actions in, and do, do something about this. So thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Murad, Nadia. Thank you, and thank you also for all the attendees and witnesses who came here. I wish that we all can work together and stand up together to stop this terrorism. And I would like also uh, uh, for, for, for you to recognize our genocide and to bring every single one from the Islamic State, whether a leader, middle, or a soldier, to bring everyone who committed these crimes to justice. We would love to see that. Uh, again, th thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, before we start, I, don't, I don't have any more questions, but I, I just would like to, certainly to thank all of you. And one of the uh, key takeaways for me here is, you know, we, we, we talk a lot here about the Golden Rule, treating other people the way we want to be treated. Uh, we, we both have children. Our children are out of school, out, of, out into the world. But uh, the schools that they went to, there was bullying. There was bullying. And uh, in some cases, I remember as a parent uh, who was aware of some bullying uh, that was going on, actually going to the school and uh, speaking out against and trying to make sure that that, uh, that did not persist. And I think we're successful. But um, the, uh, I, I applaud um, uh, folks uh, of the uh, Islamic faith. I, was, I really applaud those who are speaking up, in some cases at risk, at real risk to your own personal, personal safety. We want to make sure you don't pay any price for that, but that's a matter of, of, of real concern. But I, uh, for, the, for the kids who, uh, who are being bullied, because they happen to have a name like Al Gawari or Hassan or Nas or Murad, uh, I especially um, con I'm concerned about them, that they somehow are paying a price as, as well. And uh, they, I think part of, if I were giving them advice, it would be to, to be vocal and brave in speaking out against the kinds of abuses that we see uh, per uh, perpetrated by ISIS. And I think maybe the best protection that they have is to denounce those kind of activities. And uh, for the, for the, it may be a hard thing to ask kids to do, but I think in, at the end they will be safer and, uh, and I think uh, ultimately will, will feel better about their own, their own situation. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Carper. Again, I want to thank all the witnesses for your testimony, for your courage. You certainly have, I think, accomplished our goal of laying out a reality, helping us understand this better. Uh, we, we have a long way to go and fully understand this. The American people do, but uh, you certainly helped that. So, again, thank you for your testimony and your courage. Uh, the hearing record will remain open for 15 days until July 6th at 5 p.m. for the submission of statements and questions for the record. This hearing is adjourned.